Okay, so students, we are going to be discussing the current affairs for today and uh, some of the topics from yesterday. Uh, of all the topics, some of the most important topics are the Uniform Civil Code, which is a dynamic concept. It has been in the news time and again, so this is an important one. The special category status, this is again a dynamic topic. Uh, a lot of states, including Bihar and Andhra Pradesh, want a special category status. So this is again a topic which just keeps repeating again and over and over again. So this is an important topic. And then we have China ignored LAC pacts. This is a continuation of something we discussed yesterday. So this is again another dynamic and important topic. The rest of the topics are pretty static in nature. Moving on, the first topic that we're going to be discussing today is the Uniform Civil Code. What is the Uniform Civil Code first of all? We need to understand that the Uniform Civil Code is not one single law for all religions. It is not one single It is not one single law. Rather, it is nothing but the codification of laws for each religion based on some overarching principles. Like say, the constitution of India. The constitution of India has certain features to it. It is based on the ideas of fraternity. It is based on the ideas of liberty. So, when religious laws are codified on the basis of these principles of liberty, of fraternity, of equality, of rights, then it is known as Uniform Civil Code. Hence, similarly in, in amongst the Hindus, we have the Hindu Succession Act. We have the Hindu uh, Marriages Act. Then amongst the Sikhs, we have the Anand Marriage Act. However, the only community that has been left out of this Uniform Civil Code principles are the Muslims. And they have not had any codification of religious laws. And hence, that is the debate surrounding Uniform Civil Code. Now, context. The Uttarakhand Chief Minister promised to set up a committee for preparing a draft Uniform Civil Code. This is the reason why it is in the news currently. Since the Uttarakhand Chief Minister has promised to set up a committee to go into the Uniform Civil Code demands. Under the Constitution, Article 44. What is Article 44? Article 44 is a part of the Directive Principles of State Policy. What is it a part of? The Directive Principles of State Policy. The Directive Principles of State Policy, as you all know, it is not legally enforceable. You cannot go to the court saying that the government has not implemented my directive principles of state policy unlike the fundamental rights. Hence, this is different from fundamental rights. So, as a result, the government has not implemented the Uniform Civil Code till date. Article 44 requires the state to strive to secure for its citizens a Uniform Civil Code throughout India. But till date, no action has been taken in this regard. Now, you see why the government has not taken up the matter of Uniform Civil Code. A Uniform Civil Code seeks to provide one common law for the entire country applicable to all religious communities in their personal matters such as marriage, divorce, inheritance, adoption, etc. Currently, only the Muslim personal laws are still primarily unmodified and they are traditional. It is based on the Sharia customs. It is based on the Sharia law. It has not been codified and hence it is not in accordance with some of the principles of the Indian constitution. Like say, Article 14, which is right to equality. Need of Uniform Civil Code. What is the need of Uniform Civil Code? The need of Uniform Civil Code is so that it ensures equality. Presently in India, different communities are governed by different personal laws like the Hindu Marriage Act, Hindu Succession Act, Anand Marriage Act. However, only amongst the people who follow Islam, they are not under any personal law. And that goes against the idea of equality. 
and not just that even within the particular religion people say men and women they are treated differently women have different inheritance li- uh, rights while men have different inheritance li- uh, rights hence there is no concept of equality properly needed for national integration having a uniform civil code will help in national integration gender justice uniform civil code will also promote gender justice by removing the inbuilt discriminatory provisions of personal laws for example under the hindu law of mitakshara we had a discriminate discriminatory law over here when it came to inheritance of property as the hindu daughter was denied uh, the right to property in the case of ancestral property as she was seen as a part of the house that she is getting married into rather than as a part of the paternal house freedom of choice a religion neutral personal law would encourage protection of couples in case of inter caste and inter religious matters whenever we have uniform civil code it will encourage you know inter religious marriages because all of them would be based on the same overarching principles which are found in the constitution or any basic law however there exists certain problems when it comes to implementation of uniform civil code the first and major problem is that india is a very diverse society we have different people who follow different laws for example articles 371 a to i and the sixth schedule these particular principles of the constitution they encourage people to have their own personal laws as under article 371 a to i certain traditional laws of states such as assam nagaland mizoram and goa are actually protected when the central law is in conflict with these traditional rights of the communities from these states the traditional rights of these communities prevails over the central law so they are these people are being allowed to use their own personal laws similarly when it comes to sixth schedule tribal areas there are a lot of uh, practices of tribals such as there exists one known as nokuram amongst the tribals of northeast where they have their own personal laws which are being followed and you cannot impose uniform civil code on these people so why do you want to impose uniform civil code on muslims or people who are following islam when you are allowing these people even they should be allowed is one of the arguments plurality or diversity it has been argued that the uniform civil code threatens a pluralistic society like india where people have confidence in their respective religious beliefs the law commission of india opined that the uniform civil code is neither necessary nor desirable at this stage in the country having one common law or the basis of uh, codified laws as the constitution goes against the idea of pluralism because everything is based on the constitution itself it goes against pluralistic societies the law commission the previous law commission in 2018 it said that it is not possible in india to have uniform civil code also freedom of religion is guaranteed by the indian constitution under article 25 which grants the right to practice profess and propagate religion now this comes into conflict with the right to equality under article 14 and hence it is a problem so what can the government do so we have to go about this concept of uniform civil code in a very slow manner we have to take a piecemeal approach whenever there exists discriminatory laws like the sambhri bala case or like uh, the triple talaq case then the supreme court or the government can take a piecemeal approach one by one sort the issues rather than imposing and imposing and uh, proposing a total overhaul of changes hence you can go about it in a slow manner 
constitution exposes the cause of uniform civil code in its article 44 it shouldn't be misconstrued to be a common law this line is extremely important because it says that it is not one law for all the religions it is not one law it is just a basis of law it must be governed by uniform principles rather what is important over here is this idea of principles it should be based on the ideas of equality. It should be based on the ideas of liberty. This uniform civil code. It should be based on uniform principles rather than having a uniform law. Moving on. Second topic. Dr. Ambedkar. The Delhi government will be organizing daily shows on the life and legacy of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. So, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. B. R. Ambedkar. He, as you know, he was the chairman of the drafting commission, committee, which uh, drafted the Indian constitution. Now, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, uh, please do read uh, more about him from your spectrum. Uh, there are other points which are given over there, which are very important. I tried picking up points which are not given over there and which are important from the concept, uh, from the point of view of the exam. Uh, as you know, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar has always been a champion of the depressed classes. He called them Harijans. He led the Mahat Satyagraha. He was also uh, responsible for formation of several political outfits, such as the Forward Party, such as the Labour Party, such as the Republican Party, in order to ensure adequate justice being done to the depressed classes. Building of national institutions. The Reserve Bank of India was conceptualized from the Hilton Young's Commission's recommendations. This was the committee that recommended the formation of Reserve Bank of India. The Hilton Young Commission, commission it considered Ambedkar's guidelines laid out in the problem of the rupee, its origin and the solution. And based on this, it gave recommendation of forming the Reserve Bank of India. As a Labour member in the Viceroy's Executive Council, please do read about the Viceroy's Executive Council based on the Act of 1909, based on the Act of 1919 and based on the Act of 1935. Please do read what was the composition of the Executive Council, how many Indians were a part of it. So, as a part of the Viceroy's Executive Council from 1942 to 1946, he evolved numerous policies in the water, power and labour welfare sectors. He helped in establishing the River, Va River Valley Authority, which actively considered projects like the Damodar River Valley Project, the Son River Valley Project, and the Mahanadi Project. Further, the Interstate Water River Water Disputes Act of 1956 and the River Boards Act of 1956 emanate from his vision and from his ideas. Similarly, please do read about his contributions for the welfare of labourers and industrial workers. Everything is very straightforward. He was a member of the Bombay Assembly in, uh, in 1937. I am sure you know uh, there is a difference between provincial assemblies and the central assembly. So the executive council works at the at the central uh, as, uh, at the center level, while the provincial assemblies are those which work at the provincial levels. As a member of the Bombay Assembly, Ambedkar opposed the introduction of the Industrial Disputes Bill 1937 as it removed the workers' right to strike. He contributed to the reduction of working hours to 48 hours per week. 48 hours per week, lifting the ban on the employment of women for underground work in coal mines, introducing the provisions of overtime, paid leave and minimum wages. He had actually uh, given several recommendations and several uh, points in order to improve the conditions of women, of labourers, workers, etc. But his major contribution was to the depressed classes. As representative of the depressed classes, at the round table conference, he championed the cause of labour and improving the condition of peasants. I am sure you know that 
there was a round table conference which was held in london the round table conference we know that in the rtc 1 the congress boycotted it however dr b r b r ambedkar attended the conference as a representative of the depressed classes and he championed the cause of labor and improving the condition of peasants during the bombay assembly school on session in 1937 he introduced a bill to uh, abolish the quota system of land tenure in the konkan this was a very oppressive practice of land uh, uh, tenancy uh, do read about it further his essay titled small holdings in india and the remedies proposed industrialization as an answer to india's agricultural problem and is still relevant uh i'm sorry this particular topic ends over here uh i'm not sure why it came up over here but this topic ends over here this is the next topic special category status uh the other ideas of uh, dr ambedkar please do read uh, from your spectrum uh because he is always champion of the masses so there are a lot of points which have not been covered over here do read about his books the various organizations that he started there are books on untouchability there are books on shudras and then there are books on i mean there are institutions such as the bahishkrit bharat he has written a uh, uh, journal such as janta uh and uh, yeah so go through all of that special category status special category status and three other items were missing from a revised notice issued by the dispute resolution subcommittee before its first meeting now dispute resolution subcommittee before its first meeting the dispute resolution subcommittee was actually constituted by the union home ministry to resolve the pending disputes that exist between andhra pradesh and telangana the justification that the center has given for leaving out this idea of special category status was because it is not a part of the discussions between telangana and andhra pradesh rather it is a matter that concerns the center with andhra pradesh so they had decided that um, for this particular issue so special category status won't be a part of discussion what is the special category status now special category status has not been given in any statute it has not been mentioned in the constitution either however it is a measure of giving special benefits to certain particular states or uh, states which are at a disadvantage as compared to the others there is no provision of special category status in the constitution the central government extends financial assistance to states that are at a comparative disadvantage against the others it was based on the idea of gadgil formula as given by the fifth finance commission this happened in 1969 some of the prominent guidelines for getting special category status are the state must be economically backward with poor infrastructure the states must be located in hilly and uh, challenging terrain they should have low population density and significant tribal population should be strategically situated along the borders of neighboring countries so these are the re- these are the reasons when a special category status was earlier being given now what are the benefits of being given a special category status when a state is particularly recognized as a special category state there exists tax breaks and there exists uh, when it comes to devolution of funds there is a higher devolution of funds and when it comes to centrally sponsored schemes now i am sure you know what the difference is between central sector schemes and centrally sponsored schemes 
सेंट्रल सेक्टर एंड centrally sponsored there exists a difference between these two now under the centrally sponsored schemes the special category status states will get 90% of the total funding while only 10% will have to be from their pockets and that too that will also be given as a loan at zero interest rates to the state hence there are very good financial benefits however currently the 14th finance commission has done away with the idea of special category states except for the already existing northeastern states and the three hill states okay please do read what the three hill states over here are i can give a clue by saying that they include uttarakhand please do find out the instead it suggested that the resource gap of each state will be filled through tax devolution urging the center to increase the state share of tax revenues from 32% to 42% so currently according to the 14th finance commission the tax devolution to the states was 42% please do read according to the report of the 15th finance commission what the tax devolution is currently it is 41% according to the 15th finance commission now it has increased this and hence the finance commission has said that there will not be any special category states also in the case of ap the government had extended a special package we have a special package instead of we have a special package now instead of having any particular special category status as a part of the special package ap got around 20000 crores uh which is the amount of money it would have gotten had it been given special category status uh for that 90% devolution that I, uh, for the 90% funding for centrally sponsored schemes that i was talking about if at all ap had gotten special category status and had it been given 90% of the funds by the center for implementing schemes that is the amount of money that it would have gotten from the center so the center gave it as a special package instead of classifying ap as special category state the world food program to allot indian wheat in afghanistan india signed an agreement with the united nations world food program for the distribution of 50000 tons of wheat that it has committed to sending afghanistan as a part of the humanitarian assistance okay students please do read please do understand that afghanistan is a very is in a very perilous situation is afghanistan a landlocked country or not please do read about it afghanistan is a landlocked country now uh, afghanistan ever since the taliban came to power there has been a widespread humanitarian crisis according to the un hcr which published a report uh in 2021 the population in afghanistan uh, half the population in afghanistan which is more than 20 million people are in need of life saving humanitarian assistance an estimated 270000 afghans have been newly displaced inside the country since january 2021 around 270000 afghans have actually been additionally displaced what is the world food program it is a very static topic please do read about the lines that are given over here these are more than enough it was established by the food and agricultural organization and the unga in 1965 the headquarters are in rome italy world food program is the food assistance branch of the united nations do you remember this is the world's largest humanitarian organization focused on hunger and food security it's the largest humanitarian organization focused on hunger and food security in addition to emergency food relief world food program also offers technical assistance and developmental aid such as building capacity for emergency preparedness and response managing supply chains and logistics 
promoting social safety programs and strengthening resilience against climate change so world food program is not just there for providing food assistance but rather it provides a lot of other benefits please do read about it it does action against the climate change it ensures uh, better supply chains and better logistics and it also ensures that there is technical assistance being given this technical assistance helps in cultivation of crops in a better manner and in a more technology intensive manner the agency is also a major provider of direct cash assistance and medical supplies and provides passenger uh, services for humanitarian workers all the humanitarian workers they are usually provided passenger services and it also provides direct cash assistance for people who are in need of it next idea the indian air force is to pitch stages in the singapore air force show the indian air force will be pitching the indigenously built light combat aircraft stages aircraft alongside participants from across the world at the singapore air show now what is the stages like it has been mentioned over here it is an indigenous light combat aircraft it's an lca and it is indigenously built so more about the tejas tejas recently received the final operational clearance for induction into the indian air force as a weaponized fighter jet it has gotten clearance and now it is forming a part of the air force quadrants now the uh, tejas jet is completely indigenous in nature it was designed by the aeronautical development agency however it is produced by the hindustan aeronautics limited design concept is by this production is by this it is a single seat jet and it is a multi role jet fighter it can be used for reconnaissance it can be used for fighting capabilities it can be used for providing assistance several uh, reasons why it is being used it is also powered by a single engine and can carry out mid air refueling one of the good things is that even while it is in mid air while it is in flight it can be refueled by the use of another flight or another mechanism for providing fuel it need not land again and then take off the jet is pegged as the world's smallest and lightest supersonic fighter what is a supersonic fighter what is a sonic fighter sonic fighter is something that travels at the speed of sound a supersonic fighter is something that travels faster than the speed of sound what is the speed of sound please do read about it also read what a hypersonic and what a and what a subsonic fighter would be however it has limited reach of little over 400 kilometers and will be mainly used for close air to ground operations unlike the russian origin sukhoi or the rafael jet this is the reason why india was in the need of the rafael jet india desperately needed the rafael jet and it wanted it to be delivered at the fastest pace possible because india was falling short of these jets which can go far into the enemy territory which can take out operations which are more than 1000 uh, kilometers now uh, because uh, the tejas has a range of only of 400 kilometers the tejas is also equipped with, equipped with state of the art satellite sa state of the art satellite aided inertial navigation system next also please remember that tejas is not the first indigenous uh, aircraft uh, that is being built uh, india had already built the marut aircraft so again china ignored lac pacts now recently i'm sure you know that uh, our current external affairs minister he has gone to australia uh, as a part of the quad meeting over there he met his counterpart the australian foreign minister and over there they had uh, uh, had a discussion had a bilateral summit and uh, S. J. Shankar, uh, in his interaction with 
the journalists. He held that China's decision to amass troops along the line of actual control was a violation of its written commitments. China had made several written commitments saying that it would not amass troops along the line of actual control. However, it violated these commitments and this was the reason why the entire tense standoffs happened along the line of actual control at Galvan Valley, Depsang Plains, at Gogra, uh, Gogra Heights, at uh, Hot Springs, at Pangong. So, so many regions, there were intense and tense standoffs. That was because of China amassing troops over there. He held that Beijing was responsible for the current situation along the line of actual control and said that the situation has arisen due to disregard by China in 2020 of written agreements with India not to amass forces at the border. In his words, so when a large country disregards written commitments, I think it's an issue of legitimate concern for the entire international community. So China has violated its own written agreements and this was the reason why the condition along the line of actual control is so tense. We discussed this topic in detail yesterday. Please uh, read yesterday's, top, uh, yesterday's topic of discussion for uh, more clarity surrounding this. Now moving on. Blue Hydrogen. Reliance Industries aims to become one of the largest producers of blue hydrogen globally. Please do uh, understand that hydrogen is a climate friendly fuel. It has a lot of pollution related benefits as compared to fossil fuels. It, it emits lesser amount of greenhouse gases. It emits lesser amount of PM matter, particulate uh, emissions, etc. And there is more energy generation also when it comes to hydrogen per unit as compared to fossil fuels even. Uh, hydrogen is an alternative fuel that can be produced from diverse domestic resources. Diverse domestic resources such as water even. When water is split, it results in the formation of hydrogen. H2O splits to form H2 through electrolysis. Hydrogen is abundant in our environment and is stored in water, hydrocarbons and other organic matter. Hydrogen is an energy carrier that can be used to store, move and deliver energy. Now, we have, I told you that hydrogen has several benefits over the conventional fuels. There exist different types of hydrogen. One is the green hydrogen. When hydrogen is produced from renewable energy, using renewable energy through, say, solar energy, through uh, hydro energy, through wind energy, then this particular hydrogen is known as green hydrogen as no uh, greenhouse gases were emitted or no pollution has been caused in the, emission, in the production of this particular hydrogen. However, we have grey hydrogen which means that it is the hydrogen which is derived from natural gas and fossil fuels. By burning of these fossil fuels, if hydrogen is produced, then it is known as grey hydrogen. We have this process of steam methane reforming which is used to produce hydrogen in grey hydrogen. Blue hydrogen is also produced using fossil fuels. However, the only difference with uh, grey hydrogen is that in blue hydrogen, the byproducts which are carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide are captured and stored and hence it is better than grey hydrogen. It is less pollution intensive as compared to grey hydrogen. Now, uh, when we talk about the current production of hydrogen gas, the current global demand of hydrogen is being produced from fossil fuels majorly. Around 76% of hydrogen being produced currently comes from natural gas and around 23% comes from coal, which are both fossil fuels. With the remaining coming from electrolysis of water. In India, so I told you about green hydrogen, right? When renewable energy is used in order to do electrolysis of water, then it is known as green hydrogen. It is less pollution intensive. It is actually no pollution intensive. It is climate friendly, which is what we need. We need green hydrogen and hence green hydrogen has been a topic of discussion. It has been mentioned in the, in the budget. Please do read about green hydrogen and its benefits. In India, hydrogen is being commercially produced in the fertilizer industry. 
uh, in the petroleum refining and chemical industries and also as a byproduct in the chloralkali industries. Uh, I'm sure you would have heard about ammonia in the fertilizer industry. So hydrogen is actually produced in fertilizer industry uh, during the production of ammonia. And similarly, it is a byproduct in chloralkali industries. Clear, cleaner methods of hydrogen production chiefly constitute electrolysis via chemical or photoelectric chemical routes. So this is one of the cleanest methods of producing hydrogen gas and this would be known as green hydrogen. That's all for the day.